Welcome to the place where we learn about and learn from the leaders in our field who are powering human creativity. I am Aaron Dworkin, and this is Arts Engines. <laughs> Thanks again for joining me here on Arts Engines. Today's guest is Shea Scruggs, who serves as the Chief Enrollment Officer and Director of Institutional Research and Musician Experience at the Curtis Institute of Music. Shay, welcome to the show. Thank you, Aaron. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you again for having me. Absolutely. Well, I am so excited. Obviously, Curtis is also one of our great creative partners, but I also have been able to, you know, see firsthand some of the extraordinary impact that you've had on our field as a leader over the years. Um, you've been a leader, not just at Curtis, but in so many different initiatives uh, and projects. And so it is great to have you on the show. Um, first, you know, I thought it would be great if we could just start out, you know, a lot of times people have roles at institutions and there are those in our audience who are like, so what is actually involved in that? What, what happens in that? So I thought it'd be great if we could just start off, you know, kind of what does, what's included within your portfolio as chief enrollment officer, as well as institutional research and musician experience and kind of what are those kind of key things currently going on, uh, at Curtis? Yeah, totally. So um, essentially, I oversee admissions and enrollment, alumni relations, and institutional research at Curtis. I report to our provost. My team includes a, our musician lifecycle manager, our director of alumni relations, and our director of assessment and accreditation. So in terms of admissions and enrollment and what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, sometimes I think it's helpful if, to basically think about it in terms of what our strategic priorities are. So we, we aim in our admissions and enrollment work, we aim to cultivate a supportive and equitable process for all of our applicants and prospective students, um, including equitable access to Curtis's people, programs, our campus and performances that are held in Philadelphia and beyond. Um, we aim to increase awareness of Curtis's programs at the lo local, national and institutional level. And I'll talk about some of the programs that, um, that we do um, related to those um, a bit later. Um, in terms of alumni affairs, we cultivate opportunities for our alums to give back to Curtis. So that can look like connecting with prospective students or mentoring a fellow alum, um, which we know from our research is a way that our alums feel that resonates with them to give back to Curtis in that way. And it's a way for them to stay connected to the Curtis tradition. We aim to recognize and celebrate a diverse range of projects and career types. It's a big part of inclusion. We want our alums to feel seen and heard. And we do that through alumni features, through our Young Alumni Fund program, which I'd like to talk about in a little bit. And we also aim to be a resource for alums through career development support and career changing where needed, um, or I should say where desired. And we overall, we, we aim to strengthen the overall sense of community that our alums feel. That can look like receptions, that can look like meetings with alums where you're talking to somebody and they want a sounding board for a new project that they're working on. Um, that can look like collaborations between Curtis and the alum um, or connecting alums to other alums for collaborations for projects. And that can look like alums coming back to campus, whether it's for um, so a larger um, event like we're thinking about for, like we're planning for our centenary next year or something smaller like we have alums who say, hey, I'd love to bring some of my students to campus and um, show them around. And we do all of that. So in so, terms of a quick yeah. question on that. So I'm so curious, too, because obviously we have many people, academic institutions who mm -hmm. tune into the show. Is there any kind of clear kind of overriding priorities that you are seeing alums having these days as they're out in the field that that they're like this is what we need most now as alums of of art schools yeah i think it's i think alums at least at curtis i can say that many of our alums are really interested in careers that that are that they see as meaningful many of our alums um get really great jobs in classical music. Um, it's not unusual for them to get jobs in classical music um, very soon after graduation. But what we see is that whether or not 
um, it's something that they value when they're in school or what, whether it's something that they come to after they graduate, they tend to be really interested in in meaningful projects that are integrally related to the work that they do or supplement the work that they do. So that can look like that can look like Hilary Hahn having a, a residency at the Chicago Symphony. That can look like um, that can look like some of our alums who start projects through um, with with schools like Joe Conyers, who's a double bass principal, double bass of the Philadelphia Orchestra, but also started an incredible program called Project 440, which works with. Uh, young people in the Philadelphia area and helps them develop their own entrepreneurial spirit. So what we've seen is that now it's really important to alums, not just from a from a career development perspective, but from a from a from a, a satisfaction with their career perspective. It's very important for them to be able to develop projects, to be able to do work that they find really meaningful. So that's definitely something that resonates a lot with our alums these days. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, this is obviously it's just such extraordinary work. And and obviously the alums from Curtis have gone on and are doing extraordinary things in the in the field. Is there to kind of switch gears a little bit as you look at kind of this work and especially this very broad portfolio that you have? Um, are there kind of a couple of the top things that you think people should be thinking about in our field, both not even just at academic institutions, but other arts organizations. Are there a couple of things that for you kind of, especially now with just everything in the field and in society that you feel, these are really the key things you're focusing on and that you would encourage others to be thinking about? Yeah, it's a great, that's a great point. So uh, I can think of two or three. So um, one of them relates very closely to the work that we do in institutional research. One way that I describe institutional research, and I can't take credit for this, this is um, something that uh, that came up in a working group um, that I am in around IR, is that you would basically define institutional research as connecting people with the information they need to make good decisions. So for us at Curtis, that can look like generating insights that illuminate and frame challenges to inform decisions. Um, that can be our enrollment work, that can be EDI, that can be wellness related. Um, and then the other thing is enriching our program of assessment to support Curtis's accreditation process. And that's something that I think is very critical right now because when when is there not, when are there not changes in classical music and, and in the field, whether it's classical music, whether it's dance. Um, and so I think one of the things that's really valuable is for organizations to be using data. And that's where I think IR can be very critical because it can allow you to make sense of things. It's not just surveys. It can look like focus groups. It can look like one-on-one um, -on -one conversations. It can look like qualitative research, quantitative research. And one, things, one of the things that we do in institutional research is we work with stakeholders within the organization to make sense of all of that and to find the things that matter to them so that they can do their work, whether they're our faculty, whether they're our performance faculty, our liberal arts faculty, whether it's senior administrators um, making decisions about where they're going to invest over the next five years, 10 years. So that's a big, that's a big thing that I think every organization should be thinking about. Um, another one is, I think it's very important in higher ed, which is equitable access. I think it's critical and it's very hard to do. Um, just to use one example, I think informational lessons, some call these trial lessons, some call these consultative lessons. These are critical touch points for young musicians to be able to learn about a school. These are not just touch points for musicians to be able to you know, build relationships with faculty or with alums, although that's very important. These are, these are important opportunities for students to, for prospective students to grow. That's a period where students are growing in leaps and bounds. And being able to provide equitable access to those touch points um, really actually can help those young musicians actually perform more competitively when they audition for Curtis or when they audition in any other place. So I think that's a really big part of, um, of development in the field. And I would say the last, or not the last, but another is I think for orchestras and for higher education is that representation is really important. Representation matters. Yes, it's important to adopt equitable practices Yes, it's important to be intentional about inclusion and to define for your organization why diversity matters, which is going to be different for every organization. But you can't really do those things effectively without representation. And a lot of organizations and orchestras struggle with this. American society struggles with this. Um, we struggle with the paradigms of who has power, who can be viewed as a leader, who can be entrusted with the growth and development of teams and strategies. And so you have to put people in positions of influence and in power and give them the resources to do the work 
that your organization needs. So I think that's a, that's a handful of things. I mean, obviously there are many. No, oh, this is absolutely awesome. I'm sure there are many in our audience who are clues, uh, really cluing into this and delving into it. To dive into that a, a little bit deeper, and I love the part about especially having that representation in positions of influence and power and authority in organizations. As you look at kind of organizations across the board, if there's someone watching who's at their organization, a leader in leadership at their organization, they're like, you know, we really could and or should be doing better in this area. Um, is there kind of one or two things that you find most often organizations are not doing that they should do that the, your answer to that person would be, I would focus on this and this to like, if you really want to bring about change and not just talk about it. Yeah, I think it's a great, I think it's a great question. So, um, one of the things that I that I do in addition to working at Curtis is I'm a founding member of the Black Orchestral Network, where I also serve as a member of the steering committee. And um, I'll try to get into your question by basically talking a little bit about what brought me into that work. It was very much informed by the early part of my career where I played as an orchestral oboist. Um, I played in several orchestras, teaching, performing as a chamber musician, as a soloist. I held um, jobs in several orchestras. My first job was acting principal in the Cincinnati Symphony, the San Francisco Opera. I was um, I was principal oboe in the San Francisco Opera. I was acting principal in Cincinnati. I was ass assistant principal in the Baltimore Symphony. And so, I mean, I had really great opportunities. Um, and I decided to leave performing. Frankly, I left because many of the barriers that we are talking about right now um, we're not getting any attention at the field level. And I felt like I could do more outside of these orchestral workplaces. Um, so I decided to go to business school and it's business school that got me into doing a lot of EDI work where we're able to do things like write open letters um, for Black Orchestral Network that really focus on not just one or two things, but like eight or nine or 10 things that, or that organizations can do, whether they are audiences, whether they are musicians in the orchestras, whether they are uh, administrators in an orchestra, whether they are music directors. So to get into specific examples born from these experiences and working with my fantastic colleagues in Black Orchestra Network, things like, for example, um, using an applicant tracking system. Um, we talk a lot about diversity. We talk a lot about the picture of why haven't things changed? 1.4% of musicians in and um, in orchestras are black or Hispanic. And we are really working blindly because we don't collect data at the point of hiring. Um, another thing is looking very closely at tenure. Um, I think tenure is far too opaque. I think there's a, there are a lot of opportunities to make things more concrete, to provide more consistency and more transparency at many stages of the, of the, of the process. And that's really significant because it moves us away from this paradigm where we are looking at equity and diversity in orchestral workplaces, not really just as a product of so-called the pipeline, although pipelines are critically important, but also as, as products of what these in working environments are, what where these collective bargaining agreements um, need to be stronger, where they fall short, where, where unions, where fellow musicians um, can, do, can be doing more to, uh, to support musicians and to support their own workplaces. Oh. So, those are a handful of things, and um, and I would, I'll tell you that uh, Black Orchestral Network, um, we have a series of open letters um, that I would encourage anybody to read if they're looking for um, actionable steps that they can take in their organization or their orchestra. Absolutely, and we definitely encourage our audience to check that out. Absolutely, um, so this is also just phenomenal, and also really gives you know tangible ways that organizations can and should be really engaging further in this work. Unfortunately, we are just about out of time, but I always like to ask of all my guests. This work, there's got, obviously it's extraordinary in the impact you're having both at Curtis and obviously clearly beyond, um, but there's gotta be some tough days and on those toughest of days or where there's key challenges, are there mechanisms or things that you do as a leader that really either give you insights, give you resilience uh, during some of the toughest times? Yeah, there's a strategy that hasn't failed me yet, which is, um, basically a design thinking inspired strategy, which is bringing in essentially the end users, bringing in the people who are going to be 
um, impacted by the program that you're designing or or the policy that you're that you're shaping. Um, we use that when we develop something called our Young Alumni Fund at Curtis. Um, side note about the Young Alumni Fund: it's a annual grant program de dedicated to supporting young alums of Curtis. The grants range from one thousand dollars to ten thousand dollars, and they're part of um, Curtis's basically ongoing efforts to support alums in the years that follow graduation to help them establish their careers. We started that program with $15,000 and we brought together alums and we we worked on it. We put together a proposal. And now with the generous support of the Daniel Dietrich II um, Foundation, um, we will next, this year we distributed $75,000 to over 20 grantees and next year we will have a $100,000 to distribute. This is going to be a critical, um, this is going to be a critical and and very helpful um, addition to Curtis's ecosystem of support. And at this point, it's it's something that will exist in perpetuity. And I don't think it could have happened without bringing alums into the process and making them really a part of, of our planning process from the beginning. So in my experience, if you're, if you're encountering adversity, bringing in the people who are going to be living with the, the solution, I, I don't think you can go wrong there. Shay Scruggs, you truly are one of the arts engines who is powering human creativity in our world. Thank you for everything that you're doing and thank you for being on the show. Aaron, thank you so much for having me.